Welcome to this brief commemoration of the Armenian Genocide, which is marked on 24th of April each year. Baroness Cox, founder and CEO of Humanitarian Aid Relief Trust, who has visited Armenia and Nagorno-Karabakh many times, including during recent and past conflicts, will give a brief introduction. We are privileged to welcome also Bishop Hovakim, primate of the Armenian Church in the UK and Ireland, who will give us a message. And we shall have a reflection from a contemporary eyewitness account of the 1915 genocide. Heart, which for over 20 years has supported the Lady Cox Rehabilitation Centre in Nagorno-Karabakh, joins with Armenians everywhere in commemorating all those who have died and who have suffered in the genocide, past and present. April the 24th marks the 106th anniversary of the beginning of the Armenian Genocide, when the Ottoman government arrested and murdered hundreds of Armenian intellectuals and community leaders in Constantinople, or modern-day Istanbul. The killing then expanded into brutal massacres of the Armenian population across Ottoman lands, and the deportation of Armenian women, children, and the elderly for death marches across the desert. More than one million Armenians were killed, roughly 70% of the total Armenian population in the Ottoman Empire. The massive extermination and subsequent lack of accountability inspired Polish lawyer Raphael Lemkin to conceptualize the concept of genocide in 1944 and to campaign for its criminalization. We in heart are honored to work with Armenian partners in Nagorno-Karabakh, which is part of ancient Armenian land, which was replaced by Stalin with his divide and rule tactics into Azerbaijan. With our work there, we have witnessed continued attempts by Azerbaijan to eliminate the Armenian presence from their historic lands. And we join the Armenian community as it remembers and memorializes the loss of so many and joins in the call for more states to recognize this more recent attempt at ethnic cleansing of Armenians from Nagorno-Karabakh tragedy as another genocide. A history of unaddressed mass atrocities can hinder much needed healing and reconciliation and indeed encourage the perpetration of further genocides. Last year, Azerbaijan, assisted by Turkey, unleashed another major military offensive against the Armenians in Nagorno-Karabakh. With the use of illegal weapons, the enrollment of 4,000 Syrian jihadists recruited by Turkey, war crimes, including direct targeting of sacred sites, and the torture, mutilation, and murder of Armenian prisoners. Heart stands with voices worldwide who call for these criminal acts to be identified by their rightful name, genocide, and remembers victims of genocide everywhere. This recognition goes beyond simply the importance of historical and conceptual accuracy, but also points to a future of truth-based convention in which all would-be perpetrators recognize that the denial of genocide will not stand as a protective buffer for atrocities committed in the past, in the present, and indeed going into the future. So we hope we will work together to recognize the Armenian genocides which have taken place in the last century and this century. Thank you. And we're delighted to welcome Bishop Hovakim, who is the primate of the Armenian Church in the UK and Ireland. Bishop Hovakim, welcome to you. Hello everyone. Christ is risen. Christos Hairabi Maralots. During this Easter tide, Armenians commemorate April 24th, the day of remembering the Armenian genocide. The first thing that the Armenians do on this day is to pray in loving memory of the victims and for justice, as well as for those who continue to suffer from war crimes, atrocities, and armed conflicts. Today, my prayer is a story that I wish to tell you now. It is a story of suffering and hope, a story of resilience and victory. I shall 
tell you the story of Maritza, my great grandmother. Growing up, I remember she always wore black, dark colors, and sometimes she would sing sad, emotional songs. But Maritza would always bless people who passed by her house or visited her at home, saying with a big smile, May the Savior, Jesus, be with you. I remember if someone asked for water, she would rise at once, even in her old age, and bring the water to them. My great grandmother was born at the beginning of the 20th century in an Armenian village, Peylan, Turkey, located on the northeastern shore of the Mediterranean. When World War I started, her family went through the same ordeal as hundreds of thousands of others. They were deported to the Syrian deserts of Derzor by the Ottoman government. She never spoke about her mother, Rebecca, who was murdered on the road where multitudes were sent to their death. Maritza did speak about her sister Anush and her little brother Magadich. Anush was taken into an American orphanage, but she later disappeared. Maritza remembered the last words she spoke to her five-year-old sister. Would you write to me, Anush? She asked her anxiously. Yes, when I learn how to write, was Anush's reply. Her brother, Magadich, was a small boy, barely two or three years old. The family had, had made a vow not to cut his hair until he became seven years old, a Christian practice by pious parents, a tradition practiced until today. It is a ritual of thankfulness to God for blessing the family with a boy. As such, Magadic had long hair and wore a long dress a sort of a gown worn in early childhood. One tragic day, a few Turkish soldiers had come to the village to take away the beautiful girls for themselves. They thought Magadic was a girl, but when they raised his gown, they found him to be a boy. They hit him with the butt of a rifle. Makadich was badly hurt and asked for water. There was water nearby, but it was dirty with ash. My great-grandmother rushed to bring some of that water to Makadich, but he told her that it was dirty. In desperation, Maritza ran to find clean water, but to her horror, when she returned, Magadich had gone forever. Ever since, every time, my great-grandmother brought water to the Thursday. She was in effect giving water to her brother Magadich. She relieved his memory by quenching the thirst of others. Under conditions of starvation, those who made it to Aleppo, spawning in exchange for raisins and raisins for bread. This is but a small part of the story. Every time I remember our great grandparents, it breaks my heart even 106 years after such tragedy. 
every descendant of the survivors of the Armenian genocide has a similar story to tell. In 2020, the Armenians in Artsakh, Nagorno-Karabakh, were subjected to a genocidal war carried out with the same ignorant brutality and hatred. Thousands of innocent lives were cut short. Thousands were displaced and disposed. Indeed, the veins of Artsakh today are bleeding just like the rivers of the Tigris and the Euphrates at the beginning of the 20th century. Jesus Christ said, Blessed are those who are persecuted because of righteousness. For theirs is the kingdom of heaven. Our story today is a story of pain and suffering, but it is also a story of victory. My great grandmother Maritza survived and had children, even though she had to leave her place of birth, her homeland, and change homes several times in her life. Magadich and the one and a half million Armenians like them, like him, who lost their lives under the sword of Ottoman Turks, are our martyrs in heaven. Just as the Armenian nation survived those unspeakable atrocities at the beginning of the 20th century, so will the nation survive today and be resilient. But more importantly, as Martin Luther King said, when the time comes, we will not remember our enemies, but the silence of our friends. Today, our martyrs are crying, do not be silent. Dear brothers and sisters, our common humanity and solidarity can triumph over evil in our world when we come together in our Christian faith and defend the oppressed and the needy with one united and determined voice. Amen. And now an eyewitness account by Ambassador Henry Morgenthau. Um, and it's written in a book entitled The Ottoman Empire and Its Successors. He writes, All through the spring and summer of 1915, the deportations took place. Scarcely a single Armenian, whatever his education or wealth, or whatever the social class to which he belonged, was exempted from the order. In some villages, placards were posted ordering the whole Armenian population to present itself in a public place at an appointed time, usually a day or two ahead, and in other places the town crier would go through the streets delivering the order vocally. In still others, not the slightest warning was given. Thus, in a short time, practically everybody, young and old, was compelled to travel on foot. The gendarme, whom the government had sent, supposedly to protect the exiles, became their tormentors. They followed their charges with fixed bayonets, prodding anyone who showed any tendency to slacken the pace. Those who attempted to stop for rest, or who fell exhausted on the road, were compelled, with the utmost brutality, to rejoin the moving throng. They even prodded pregnant women with bayonets. If one, as frequently happened, gave birth along the road, she was immediately forced to get up and rejoin the marchers. When the victims had travelled a few hours, Kurds would sweep down from the mountains' homes, from their mountain homes. Rushing up to the young girls, they would lift up their veils and carry the pretty ones off to the hills. They would steal such children as pleased their fancy and mercilessly rob all the rest of the throng. If the exiles had started with any money or food, their assailants would appropriate it, thus leaving them a hopeless prey to starvation. 
they would steal their clothing and sometimes even leave both men and women in a state of complete nudity. All the time that they were completing, com committing these depredations, they would freely massacre, and the screams of women and old men would add to the general horror. And thus, as the exiles moved, they left behind them another caravan, that of dead and unburied bodies, of old men and of women dying in the last stages of typhus, dysentery and cholera, of little children lying on their backs and setting up their piteous wall wails for food and water. There were women who held up their babies to strangers, begging them to take them and save them from their tormentors, and failing this they would throw them into wells or leave them behind bushes, that at least they might die undisturbed. Behind was left a small army of girls who had been sold as slaves, frequently for a medjidi or about eight, for about 80 cents, and who, after serving the brutal purposes of their purchasers, were forced to lead lives of prostitution. A string of encampments, filled by the sick and the dying, mingled with the unburied or half-buried bodies of dead, marked the course of the advancing throngs. Flocks of vultures followed them in the air, and ravenous dogs, fighting one another for the bodies of the dead, constantly pursued them. The most terrible scenes took place at the rivers, especially the Euphrates. Sometimes, when crossing this stream, the gendarme would push the women into the water, shooting all who attempted to save themselves by swimming. Frequently, the, frequently, the women themselves would save their honour by jumping into the river, their children in their arms. On the 70th day, a few creatures reached Aleppo. Out of the combined convoy of 18,000 souls, just 150 women and children reached their destination. A few of the rest, the most attractive, were still living as captives of the Kurds and Turks. All the rest were dead. And during the years of the genocide, it is estimated that one and a half million Armenians died, along with an estimated 700,000 Syriacs and others. We have heard some of the stories, past and present. May we strive to honour the memory of all who have suffered and all who continue to suffer. The peace and justice may prevail for the Armenian people. May the God of all Grant perfect rest and shelter to the souls of all who have died. May their souls be bound in the bond of life with the Creator forevermore. Thank you. God bless you.